I, uh, <clears throat> this morning I want to try something that I, I don't know how it's going to go over. And uh, so I'm a little bit hesitant because I'm going to sing to you in just a second. And if you know the song, I want you to sing with me. All right? The song is going to take you, uh, hopefully, all the way back to vacation Bible school, maybe. Maybe it's going to take you back to when you went to children's church. Uh, I really don't know if they sing it anymore, but this is a song that uh, I learned when I was a kid, and it's one that has stuck with me all for years, and as I was thinking about this text this week, and uh, our, our lesson called Body Language, uh, hopefully it will uh, um, resonate with you. Before we do that, maybe we should pray before we sing. <laughs> the Lord, we... we do love you and we praise your name and we ask God that you bless us today as we look at Paul and we continue to ask the question, Father, what does it mean to be your people as we went through the book of Exodus and what does it mean to, to live together as people who exhibit the quality of love that you have poured out upon us through your Holy Spirit. Give us eyes to see, Father. Give us ears to hear. Which you are saving. It is in your son's name that we pray. <clears throat> Amen. Alright. We're going to try it. Okay? Be careful little hands what you do. Be careful little hands what you do. There's a father up above looking down in tender love. So be careful little hands what you do. Be careful little figure out how to be obedient to it. Isn't that the truth? Yes. And that song says pretty much in another way, poetically, what Paul has said in Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6, talking about body language. Well, we want to be careful what our hands do, and we want to be careful where our feet go, and we want to be careful what our eyes see. And we definitely want to be careful what our mouths say. Is that not true? Paul says, Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with thanksgiving. That is language, is it not? And since he's talking to the body, he's talking to the, the family of God, he's talking to the church in Colossae, this church that we've investigated before, they are having some issues, just like almost every church in the New Testament. How in the world can this church be what God wants them to be? Well, they need to follow Paul's example. They need to exalt Jesus Christ. They need to uh, know that they have been united. And Paul says, bringing himself into this, Devote yourself to prayer. Now, if I want to bring in the language of love that we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks here, and having a place that's permeated with shalom or God's peace, I want that in my family, I want that in with my relationship with my husband, my wife, my son, my daughter. Perhaps a good place to begin is by devoting ourselves to prayer. I, 
I don't know about you. Um, I, I can talk about myself for just a few moments here, um, because that's all I know. I was raised in a family where we prayed, you know, for various functions. And most of the time what we prayed for in my particular family was anytime you had food in front of you, you had to pray. Okay? I don't care where you were, I don't care what it was. If you got food, you prayed for it. That's not a bad thing. But I can tell you as I was growing up and moved out of the house, and that, that kind of stuck with me. I always feel guilty when I take a bite before I eat. But I almost found myself, especially when I started moving into my 30s and some things happened in my life, you know, that the only time I ever did pray was when I was about to eat something. Well, I don't know about you, but Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer. When it comes to the problems that we have, the, the issues that we're facing, the things that are good, that are happening in our lives, I mean, Paul does say, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with what? Not complaining, per se, but with what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. I mean, making my life alert to the things that are going on around me, the good things, the blessings. Now, those things come from God. Every good and perfect gift is from the Lord, the Scripture says. Is that not so? I mean, everything that good happens in your life every single day is something that is a blessing. Sometimes we in the world, we have skeptics talk to us, and sometimes we Christians wrestle with it as well. It's called the problem of evil, the problem of suffering. Well, that is a, a strange and, and a conundrum that we have to wrestle with, and there's a serious challenge with that. But sometimes we also have to deal with what uh, Philip Yancey one time called the problem of pleasure. The problem of pleasure. Why is it that good things happen to good people? Or why is it that good things happen at all? I have to believe that God has got His hand in there somewhere. Don't you? Yes. And by having that, devoting myself, being careful what your hands do and your feet do and where your, your eyes see and your mouth says, well, you know, sometimes it brings me back to finding the good. My mom used to say to me, Robert, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything good, at, uh, anything at all. That's pretty good advice, yeah. isn't it? Yes. It is so easy to be a person who is on the other side. We talked about this last week. It's so easy to be a person who is, is full of criticism. It takes very little courage and takes very little smarts, really, to be a critic. But it takes a great deal of courage and a great deal of insight to find the good and praise it. Find it. Devote yourself to prayer because I promise you, if we're devoting ourselves to prayer, God will let you know what the good is. God will show you, He will reveal it to you, what the good is. And perhaps we don't see the good going on around us because we haven't given ourselves over to prayer. So in the body life here at Palo Verde, in the body life that you have in your home, I want to encourage you. I know that you, you think preachers are supposed to do this, and yes they are, and so I'm going to do it. I want to, I want to encourage you to pray in your home, not just when you have food in front of you. I want you to pray when you get your food, but I want you to talk with your daughter. Dads, I'm telling you, you may feel awful weird at first, but one of the best gifts you can ever give to your daughter is taking her out and go for a walk and sitting on the bench and praying with her. I'm promising you. The, the nights that she goes out on a date and she comes back and you have doing, been doing that with her, I guarantee you're going to have less tums to take. <laughs> Do you agree with me? Amen? Amen? You know, I saw a shirt on the internet yesterday, or maybe it was the day before, and it had, you know, big letters on the back that says, Dad! Dad's against daughters dating. <laughs> says, shoot the first one and then spread the word. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> 
I sent it to Rachel and tell you. <laughs> but you know, see, you don't have to worry about that. You know what I mean? If, if we devote ourselves to prayer, we, we pull God into the relationship that we have with our sons and our daughters, our husbands, our wives, and it becomes natural. It really is a shame that talking to your son or your daughter or your husband or wife seems as strange as talking to them about Russian or Chinese or some other thing when it should be as natural as breathing. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us as well. Here's body language. Prayer is what it's all about. Stuff coming out of our mouths. I want you to devote yourself to prayer. And then he says, I want you to pray for me. Now, I can't pray for Paul. Paul's already with the Lord right now, so that's not... What, what I can do is in this context of what we're talking about, is we can learn to pray for one another. Is that not so? We have our list that we put out every single week. If we have this, this issue or whatever it is, I mean, every single one of us has issues. We talked last week about how, you know, conflict is inevitable, is it not? But bathing <coughs> that by devoting ourselves to prayer changes the dynamic of conflict. It really does. I don't know if I've ever told this story. I remember um, this was, I guess I had to be 23, 24 years old. I was preaching at uh, Barton Avenue Church of Christ in New Orleans. <clears throat> and um, I had a fellow there that I, I, I could never do anything whatsoever to please this person. And I remember in, in this particular meeting, we, had a, we didn't have elders, we had a business meeting. And it was called the men's business meeting. And this guy was just going on and on and on. And I mean, I just felt like I wanted to slither out underneath the door and just, just run away. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to quit. And I remember I had a fellow who was sitting across on the other side. And, and when this fellow finished his tirade, I mean, I was just ready to reach over and just jump on top of him. But that was my sinful nature rearing its ugly head. And, and this fellow, whose name was Bill Reeves, I, I have great respect for Bill. Um, when this fellow stopped, he said, you know, I heard the same sermon that you did that Bobby preached. I didn't hear any of that. He said, there's one big difference between you and me when it comes to Bobby. He said, you don't like Bobby. And I do. And that's the bottom line. I pray for him. And this was the line too. I pray for him, and you do not. That shut that brother down like you would not believe. Because it wouldn't matter what I said or did or whatever, because he had already decided he didn't like me. That was the bottom line. It didn't matter what I did. It didn't matter what I said. He just simply didn't like me. You know how unchristian that is? Devote yourselves to prayer, Paul says, keeping alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us as well that God will open the door for the Word. Sometimes the opening that door for the Word takes place right in your own home. Sometimes that opening the door takes place when you go into Circle K. Sometimes it takes place at the ball game on Friday night. Sometimes it happens when the police officer pulls you over. Sometimes it happens in the context of an elders meeting or a deacons meeting. But by devoting ourselves in prayer, we're actually letting God come in and be a part of the conversation. He goes on and he says... Verse 5, conduct yourselves wisely toward outsiders. Isn't that really interesting? What we do as a body and the relationship that we have for one another 
has a direct impact on the way the people around us in the world perceive not just the church, but Jesus Himself. And so Paul says, I want you to pay attention to what your hands are doing, and I want you to pay attention to what your feet are doing, and what your eyes are doing, and what your mouth is doing. I want you to conduct yourself wisely. And again, talking about speech, he says, making the most of the time, let your speech always be gracious. Now again, that takes me right back to what my mama used to say. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything good at all. I don't say anything. Hmm. But what does it mean to be gracious? Or the NIV says, full of grace. Seasoned with salt. I like seasoning on my food. Anybody else like that? I cannot stand. I'm Italian. Okay. I grew up with spice. Okay. I, I lived in a Hispanic home for many years of my life. I like spice. I can't stand bland food. I don't like it. I, when I moved to Milwaukee, Milwaukee is good of many things, but you know, those Eastern Europeans just don't know how to cook nothing. <laughs> okay? They didn't put salt on their potatoes. They don't even put pepper on them. I'm like, this is, what is this? This is supposed to be stew, man. It's soup. And I mean, it's water. I mean, I remember we went to one thing one day, and, and it was a, a church outing, and they had made this giant roast. Now, I had lived in New Orleans, and man alive, when they had church functions, they had these big, oh, man, Fish fries and oh, it was great. Got there and I was like, okay, I need to find the Tabasco sauce, I need to find the pepper, I need to find the everything under the sun. You know what spice is for. Spice is to make something taste good. Doesn't it? The other day, because I was I'm on a diet, you know, and so I decided that I'm trying to have more vegetables in my life, okay? I don't particularly like vegetables a whole lot. So I've been trying to have more veggies in my life, and I remember this old commercial that I saw years ago that you can drink your veggies. You can drink that, you know? Called V8. Well, so I went to the store, and I got a V8. And I was standing there, and I was looking at the, the shelf, and I saw one that said reduced salt. And I'm like, that's even more healthy. You know? I got that and I poured it out. <laughs> I did not have my veggies that day. Well, it was horrible. It was horrible. I went and I got a Dr. Pepper and it was great. <laughs> okay? ACVA. Paul. He says, look at yourself, okay? We can be a V8 juice without any salt in it. And people pour it out on the ground. It doesn't do a bit of good. I don't care how many vitamins and minerals you have in you, you still taste terrible. And Paul says, be full of grace. Be seasoned with salt. That's our speech. So, how can we do that? I got two suggestions for you. Number one, be careful about what you actually talk about. You know that? Be careful about what you talk about. Everything under the sun is not kosher for Christians to talk about. It's not. If love and relationships are our goal, in between me and my wife, and me and my son and my daughter, me and my brothers and sisters sitting here, then um, everything is not for game. We are Christians. And so, be careful what you talk about. Ask yourself, 
again, this takes me back to the daughter illustration. You know, I, I, I love having a spiritual conversation with Rachel and Talia. I'm not putting myself up like this, but since the day they were born, I have cultivated a certain relationship with Rachel and Talia where we can, we can talk about anything. We read books together. We text. They'll tell me about this dude at school. At school, and, and then I start on my lecture, and Talia just says, Dad, lighten up. <laughs> or I need to take my chill pill, as she says. <clears throat> That's okay. But having a spiritual conversation, if there is no difference at all between the conversations between Christians than when you go to Buffalo Wild Wings and watch the ball game, something is wrong. Can we not engage in a, a conversation with my brothers and sisters that goes beyond just the veneer of things? Can we? Can we engage in real life stuff without worrying uh, how it's going to be? Now, the stuff that is the off-limits is the dirty laundry. Okay? I, I don't need to hear about somebody else's dirty laundry. If you want to tell me that you love somebody, that's great. If you want to tell me something good that's going on in their life, that's wonderful. I don't need to know the negative things about another brother or another sister or anybody else for that matter. Amen. I just simply don't. That is not seasoning my speech with salt that's turning my V8 juice, which is supposed to help me, into something that I want to pour out on the ground. It is horrible. So we need to be careful about what we actually talk about. Find something good to talk about. And there are tons of stuff. Sometimes it, it surprises me sometimes, and it really shouldn't, but sometimes it really does surprise me when I hear two people that I know are Christians actually talking about God. Now, I love football, and I love baseball, and I love basketball, and I love all kinds of other things, and I would sit down and talk to you about those things any day of the week. And I love my family, and I love Harleys, and I love all that good stuff, and we can have a long conversation. And that's okay. But sometimes we just need to also have a relationship where we can engage in something else. It's body language. Where you can encourage me and I can encourage you to be devoted to prayer to season your life with soul. Number two on that is be careful who you talk to. That might seem a little strange at first. <clears throat> By that I mean is that it's sometimes so easy for us to get into a rut where we talk to the same people over and over and over and over again. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke chapter 14. He's talking about having people over for dinner here. And hospitality is a great spiritual gift. He says in Luke chapter 14 verse 12, He said to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, give invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Sometimes we need to expand our circle of people who we talk to. One was, and I'm not really, I don't know your life as well as maybe I should, perhaps. When was the last time you had a brother or sister over for dinner in your home? When was the last time you saw somebody sitting over there and said, I wonder what they're doing today. I want to go out to lunch with them. Now, if you're like me, there's four or five of y'all that typically I get invited somewhere to do something. Sometimes I go to Taco Bell or whatever. And um, But a few of y'all, it doesn't surprise me to get an invitation to go somewhere sometime. 
And I can follow in that as well as anybody. We need to expand our horizon and say, I want to throw God's net and His fellowship and His love to everybody, not just my circle of approved friends. Does that make sense? And let's be what Jesus calls us to be. So, He says, Conduct yourselves wisely towards outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with soul, so that you may know how you ought to answer everyone. Our body language should reflect the fact that we are welcoming people. Anybody and everybody. That we are watching what we're saying. We're going to say the good things and we're not going to say the bad things. We're going to be inclusive in our reaching out. Whether they just come out of the street or whether it's somebody on the other side of the auditorium you haven't talked to in 10 years. And I believe that that will help any family, including Palo Verde, be what God wants us to be. So, I don't know what time it is. Let me look real quick. It is time to stop. And uh, <clears throat> remember, be careful, little tongue, what you say. There's a father up above looking down in tender love. We tell our children this, but when we tell our children this, do we believe what we're telling them? Do we live like we believe what we are telling them? There is, in fact, a father up above. He is, in fact, looking down in tender love. He knows what you say and He knows what you do. <coughs> I want Him to be proud of what He hears and what He sees. Don't you? Let's sing a song. Yeah, just a